So you can open your Bibles to the book of Psalms 111. And um, I tell you guys, when we, when we look at these words, Jesus said his words are spirit and their life. And there's just something about these words when you read that will just impart life to your souls. And um, Psalm 111 and 112 are an acrostic, which is literally, it's a form of poetry, Jewish poetry, where each line begins the letter of the Jewish alphabet. There's 22. They don't line up exactly with the way the verses are set up. And then we'll probably do 113 and 114. And 113 to um, 118 are called the Hillel Psalms, which are praise and worship. And um, a theme that stands out in these um, first couple of Psalms has to do with the fear of the Lord. That's not terror. It's just being in awe of Him. And you know, you can be in, you can be in the fear of man. You can worry about what people think and spend your whole life trying to please people. You can live your life pleasing yourself. So many people live by the philosophy, I want to do what I want to do and what's best for me. And that's, that's their philosophy. And both those are a dead end. We need the fear of the Lord. We need to have the awe and respect of Him. Lord, what do you want for my life? And what's neat is you'll see that as you live like that, that there's blessings that come with it. And um, God's plan is better than our plan for ourselves. God's plan is better than what other people think we should do. And, um, and so I want to pray that just the Lord would um, just impart His life. Again, these words are so rich, so encouraging. And it's just like eating like the best steak to where you just want to take it slow and just let the Holy Spirit minister. So, Lord, I thank you for your word. As I've been looking at these verses the last few days, there's just there's a richness to them and encouragement. It's so good to get away from the world and the confusion and the strife that's going on around us and just hear from you. And Lord, we need to hear from you, every word. And I'm gonna speak to us, open our eyes. Lord, I pray that we would fear you and not man and not even our own opinion, but all we care about is what you want. And I ask this in your name, Jesus, amen. So Psalm 111, again, acrostic, he says, praise ye the Lord. So you're told to praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Listen guys, praise is a part of worship. Worship is giving your life to the Lord, but praise is an expression. It literally says in Hebrews, it's the giving of thanks. Okay, so we're told to praise Him and notice He says, with my whole heart. Listen, don't praise God half-heartedly. Anybody ever here sat during the music and you're kind of like thinking about something else, but kind of going along the words not paying attention to what they mean. Anybody ever have that happen? It's easy to have it happen. And so I, I try to focus on what am I saying? What am I meaning? And I, I want to express that to God. And, um, and here's the thing, guys. And it says, in the assembly of the upright in the congregation, praising the Lord is where God will fill you with His Spirit. In Psalm 22, it says He inhabits the praises of His people. So when we start praising Him, when we singing to Him, inhabits means He dwells in. How many of you want God's presence to come upon you? When you sing to Him, when you worship Him, there is something tangible about God's presence. And I can remember growing up where, you know, songs were just kind of boring and I and I didn't get it. And somewhere, I don't know, about 1981, I was about 19 years old, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just remembered when it was just like, as I started singing, I just entered into God's presence. It's real. It's tangible. He inhabits the praise of His people. If you worship Him with your whole heart. And it also says in Ephesians 5, it says, Be filled with the Spirit. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. How many of you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Listen, sing to Him, worship Him. We should have worship going on all the time. And um, when I'm in the car, I'll have worship on, you know, on my computer. A lot of times when I'm studying. What's cool about YouTube is every song you can imagine is right on there. And I'll just click it, and then they just kind of keep going on to other songs. And um, man, oh man, just we want worship going through our minds. So many people do deal with anxiety and being depressed, but a lot has to do with what they're thinking about, what they're looking at. And you want to be lifted up? Start praising God and thanking God. And it's a choice. You don't go by your feelings. Guys, do it because it is right. And as you as you praise Him and worship Him, something happens. God responds to that. And um, I believe, you know, it's funny, I actually saw somebody posted, they were at some Christian concert, and it was really 
of need. The worship is awesome. And they said, I wish I could relive this. And I just posted, I said, you can relive this every moment of every day. Because I do. Guys, I am constantly filling my heart and mind with worship. Constantly. And see, once you put it in your mind, what happens? What does your mind do with it? You ever have songs replay in your mind? That's why I hate secular music. I hate it because I don't want it going through my mind. Okay, I want worship and praise going through my mind. And when that's going through my mind, I think that there's even a song where it says, I got a, a whole church choir in my soul. You ever heard that song? And I'm like, what does he mean by that? What he means is, is he heard worship and now it's going through his mind and it's in his soul all the time. We can live every moment of every day with worship going through our minds. And so we're told to pray him with the whole heart. He says, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure in them. Works of the Lord as in contrast to our works. Religion is the works of man. Look what I've done, God. And um, idolatry is all about the works of man's hands. And, and we're so caught up in what we can do. Christianity is not about what you can do for God. It's about what God wants to do through you. The key to Christianity is learning to yield to him. I tried to be the perfect Christian all my own efforts and they ended up burned out, torched, and a wreck. Okay, it destroyed me. That's what works will do. That's what religion will do. I'm the only person I know that fell away from God trying to follow him, okay? And then I and then I understood, learned about grace. And it's not about what I do. It's about what God does through us. It's learning to rely upon him. How many of you want the power of God upon your life? That comes as you realize you can't do it and you rely upon him. Any weakness anyone in this room has, it's because you're relying upon yourself. When you realize you can't and you, and you start crying out, it says the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in those whose hearts are perfect towards him. Hearts perfect is the context is those who rely upon him. Lord, I can't do this. I can't, you know, whether it's being a husband or a wife, whether it's being, you know, in the workplace, patience, kindness, love, sharing my faith, fill in the blank, whatever I'm trying to do, Lord, I need you. And when you cry out to God, his power is going to be there. The works of the Lord are great. It isn't about what we do. It's about what he does. I want to line up with his works. Sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. I want to see God work. I want to see him move. His work is honorable and glorious. God does far greater than us. You know, Chuck, oh, Chuck Smith always talked about how he wanted a church of 300. That was his works. And then God moved, and, and he, had, he was a pastor of a church of 20,000 people. You know, 2,000 churches came out of that church. You know, God's work was far beyond his. See, I don't want to be limited by what I can do. I want God to do impossible things through me. How many of you want that? And we can expect that. And he wants to if you rely upon him. And his righteousness endures forever. God is always right. What he does is right. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Think back to Moses in the Red Sea and Jericho. Think of all the miracles, David and Goliath. And you know what? We can, I can look back and see so many things in my life where I saw God's hand moving. I just shared this today. There was a meeting of a bunch of pastors in this area and they're praying for a revival in Cleveland. 1981, I had a vision and, um, of God moving you know, in a spiritual desert. And he was going to send me to plant a church. And um, uh-oh. Is it anybody hot? Is it okay? You guys okay temperature-wise? Anybody hot? You know, hot. Okay. You know, I'm hot because of these lights. That's why. Anyway, all right. Um, I'm being baked. I'm getting like a sunburn right now. Hey, guys, I need to get like suntan lotion. Anyway, matter of fact, hey, Dave, turn this down a little bit. This is like cooking me. <laughs> I'm like a sweat dripping off me because these lights. Anyway. But it says, um, he's made his wonderful works to be remembered. We need to remember what he's done. Um, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Guys, we approach him because of his grace. Compassion means he's moved with the suffering and the hardship we go through. Jesus saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion. God sees what you're going through. His heart is moved by the struggles and battles so much that he came down and died on a cross for us. And we need to be like him. He has given meat to them that fear him. Now, think about food. He provides for our needs, but I think there's something greater than that. It's spiritual meat, and it's this, this book. 
This book is food for your spirit. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. His covenant for the Jews was keep the law and you're blessed. If you don't, you're cursed. That's not the covenant we're under. We're on the covenant that Jesus paid for our sins. And he's always mindful of that. Meaning when he sees you, he sees you under what Jesus did on the cross. And so that grace is there. He has showed his people the power of his works. And again, guys, look at the book of Acts. I've seen God's power. I was at a, a school, a college in San Diego, where three guys were praying for revival. And a Bible study, they went from 11 to 20 to 40 to 80 to 160 to over 300 in that many weeks. I saw people saved, baptized the Holy Spirit, given the supernatural gifts, turn this canvas upside down. And um, and it's, 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 it's so awesome when God moves. I want to see him do it in the city. And that's what we've been praying for for 25 years. He has showed his people the power of his works and that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. You know, God, how many of you want to see God give us this land, Cleveland? And I'm praying for that, guys. I'm not going to stop praying for it. The works of his hands are verity, which is truth and judgment. What he does is right. All his commandments are sure. Now, when you think of commandments, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of commandments? The Ten Commandments, right? Well, you know, there are things that he tells us not to do, and that's for the most part what the Ten Commandments are, but we're actually under Jesus' commands. Okay, we were not, we're not under the law anymore, we're under Christ. So what are Jesus' commands? And I can put it, I can put Jesus' commands to, to three commands. If you follow these, you're going to be doing everything he wants. First, in John 14, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. So the first thing is, put your trust in Jesus. That's a choice. Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you. I believe you're the Christ. The second is in Matthew 11. He says, if anyone labor, let him come to me and learn of me. He says, you'll find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So believe in him, trust him. That's a choice. And then the next is you need to come to him and learn of him. Every one of us have to have time that we spend time with Jesus. You talk to him, you've got to listen to him. Every blessing, every breakthrough, any good thing in my life has come from this quiet time where I get alone and I just learn of him. I listen to what he says. That's how you get to know him. So believe, listen to what he says. And then he says in John 13, he says, a new commandment I have given to you, that you love one another as I've loved you. You know, why is that new? Were we always told to love? Well, in the past it was love others as you love yourself. Now he says, love others as I love you. So how did Jesus treat us? How did he treat everyone else? Even his enemies? That's how we're to treat people. You know, we're, we're nice to our friends, but our tendency is to not be kind to our enemies. But Jesus was kind to his enemies. What did he, what did he do when he was crucified? What did he pray. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so believe in him, come to him and learn of him, and then his life will flow through you and how you treat others. He goes on, he says, um, they stand fast forever. It's God's word. Forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. God's word is the only thing solid. He sent redemption to his people. Redemption means bought out of slavery. You were a slave to sin. You were a slave to the devil. You were saved to the, a slave to the flesh. And so he's freed you from the devil. He's freed you from sin. He's freed you from the world. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his his name. Reverend means his name is to be an all of. I don't like it and it's happened over the years where somebody calls me Reverend Booker or I get a letter with that and I say, look I am, wh whose name is Reverend? Holy and Reverend is whose name? His name. I'm not Reverend. Do not call me Reverend. Okay. There's only one person who's Reverend. And then verse 10, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Guys, this is powerful. This is life changing if you grow grasp what this is saying. Now let's think about wisdom for a second. There's intellect. That's your ability to maybe remember. Who here's got a good memory? Anybody got a good memory? I always had a photographic memory, okay? And then there's, you know, there's memory. Then there's your intellect, the ability to understand things, like calculate things. Who's good in math here? Anybody good in math? 
Who's good at math? Anybody? No one's good at math? Anybody good at... Now, some people are good at, like, languages, not math, but there's another part of the brain. Who's good at, like, languages and artsy kind of stuff? You know I mean? I'm not good at that. Anybody here like physics? Who likes physics? I love those kind of things. Nobody? Nobody here likes physics? Okay, there we go. I, and, and those things I'm good at, but... That, you know, so you've got memory, the ability to calculate and understand. There's understanding, which I think is more insight into things. And I remember when I was in the Air Force, this radar maintenance, 11 month school, you know, everybody's trying to memorize all this stuff. I tried to understand, okay? And you want to be able to understand how things work, not just memorize, but, but wisdom, it's different than all those. Wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. You can be smart and a fool. Okay, you can have a... I mean, what does it say about those who believe in evolution? In Romans 1, professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Well, there's intellectual smart people that are stupid, okay, when it comes to, because they don't have, they're, and it says the fullness said in this heart there is no God. Now, it's funny, me and Sheila, I tend to have more intellect. But you know what? She has a lot. She has more wisdom. I would just admit it right now. She has a lot of wisdom. You know, and she kids her around. She thinks, I think she's stupid. I do not think you're stupid, and I've never said that. She said, you think I'm stupid, honey. I've never said that. But she has a lot of wisdom, the proper use of knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the foundation for wisdom, knowing what's right, the proper use of knowledge, starts with you fearing God. This isn't terror of God. It isn't being afraid of Him. It says, perfect love casts out all fear. This is to be in awe of him. And it's in contrast to fearing man. Okay, in the, in the Proverbs it says the fear of man brings a snare. What's the fear of man? That's peer pressure. Anybody here ever worry about what people think? You know, their dress. and There's so many things, especially in school, in high school. It's all about, you know, trying to fit in. Okay, and there's a, there's a, there's a peer pressure. Let me tell you something. If you try to please people, and that's what's motivating you, you will be frustrated. It is impossible to do. It is a snare. It'll destroy you. Um, also, I think, you know, if we, some people elevate their own opinion. You know, I'm going to do what I think is right. That's a dead end. The fear of the Lord, it says, is... Is a fountain of life. Let that sink in. God, what do you say is right? You know, when you get up in the morning, Lord, what is your will? You know, and if you're if you're if you're in a group of people, maybe at work, and somebody's having an affair, and everybody's patting them on the back and saying this is great, you know it's wrong. And so now, are you gonna laugh? Are you gonna go with the crowd? Or are you gonna say this ain't right. This is wrong, man. You're in sin. And see, who do you fear? I'll tell you what, guys. I fear God more than man. You know, and Sheila says I'm probably on the other extreme where I could care less what people think. Okay? And it's just because, you know what? All that matters is what God says. And right now, the church is bowing. This whole cultural relevance thing, it's all about trying to fit in with the culture to reach the culture. Do you realize the church is never called to that? We are called to confront the culture. The culture is wrong and it's leading to death. And we need to stand up and speak truth even if people hate our guts. And um, who do you fear? Who you, you know what's interesting? If you fear God, you have no one else to fear. Do you realize that, guys? If I fear God, I don't have to fear anyone else because who's going to defend you if you stand up for the Lord? He's going to. And let me tell you something. We're living in a day. Get used to it. That you speak truth and stand up for truth, you're going to be hated. Abortion is murder every time. I can't believe how many. I mean, I, I see. I just saw somebody. One of the political candidates says the Bible teaches it's okay to kill a baby up to the point of birth. One of the one of the political candidates just said this this week, and he quoted from the Bible. I don't know about you guys. I want to smack that guy. You know that's wrong. You know, I don't hate gays, but you know what? That homosexuality is an abomination in the sight of God. It's wrong. And it'll never be okay no matter what laws they pass. And I just saw another article where they said literally the goal of the gay agenda is the end of Christianity. Because they're convicted, they're guilty, they think we're the problem. But if we all stopped, if we none of us existed, they'd still be convicted. Why? Because what they're doing is wrong. Islam. 
you know, there's the quote, the one senator, some people did something, you know, caused 9-11. No, no, no. Muslims who are following the letter of the Quran did this. Muslims are people deceived by Islam. Islam is poison. It's a lie. It's a false doctrine. It's wrong. And, you know, we got we to gotta say it. Now, just those three things I've said, how would you be received <laughs> if you say this publicly? But guess what, guys? we got to speak truth. The fear of the Lord. God, what do you think? It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. Is the beginning of wisdom. Start there. Worry about, what, worry about what God says. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Listen, a good understanding. What does that mean, a good understanding? See, you look at processes. You see cause and effect. And a good understanding is someone who, what, who does his commands. What does it say in James? It's not just the hearers, but the doers of the word. You might know the Bible, but now you got to apply it. And what does it mean you have good understanding when you do it? You know, you kind of look, you know, every time I go against what God says, I end up suffering and being miserable. And when I do what he says, I see blessing. Hmm. When I watch people, <laughs> I watch people over the years. Gosh, I just had somebody got a little mini debate on Facebook. This person was saying how happy they are living for the Themselves. They don't need anyone else. They don't need a savior. Some, and they had this big paragraph. And I'm like, the person was like 21. You know, and I'm like, you know, all I can say is I've seen people with your philosophy and I've watched for 40 years and they end up miserable and empty. I said, you, you're at the beginning of it. I've seen people at the end of it. Okay, good understanding as I watch. You know, I see people who honor God like Chuck Smith and Corey Ten Boom. And I see him putting his word first. And I see the fruit of that. I see the blessing. It's like, you know, I think this is the way to live. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. When God says forgive, you forget. When he says pray, you pray. When he says give, you give. Share your faith. Read your Bible. Whatever the Bible says, you apply it. And guess what? Man, this is the right thing. Jesus said if anyone will do his commands, they'll not know if what he says is of the truth. He says if you continue my word, then you'll know the truth by experience. I've experienced truth for 40 years. This book is correct. It's, it's God's word. Psalm 112. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord. Now, we're talking about the fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom. Now, let's look what follows. If you make it your decision, Lord, all I care about is what you think. I'm going to honor you. If everybody at work is ripping off the company, you don't do it. Okay? A lot of people can get away with things and do things in secret. Do you, you, you know what you are in secret is the real you, by the way? Do you realize that? It's not what you are in front of people. That's not the real you. It's what you do when no one's looking. And see, if you realize God's looking and you live for him, before him, always, that's someone who fears God. Blessed is the man that it's not terror of him, it's in awe of him. That delights greatly in his commands. Lord, I want to do what you want. You know, your commands are right. So let's see the blessings. Well, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. If you fear God and put him first, your children are going to be mighty on the earth. God's going to use them. How many of you with kids? Kids here want to see your kids affect the world for God. That's all that matters. I want to see my kids affect the world. And right now, so far, my children, I see God's hand on them. I see him blessing them. And I think he's going to use each one of them. My, when I pray for my kids, I'm not praying for degrees and, and, and a lot of money and big houses and that kind of success. What I pray for my kids every day is that they be filled with the Holy Spirit and that God would use them. I literally pray for them by name. You know, go right down the line. Sometimes I'll throw little comments in about each one, what I know is going on in their life. But it's like, Lord, fill them, use them. You know, so my kids, they may not, any of them may not be rich, but they're going to have an impact. I want them to impact every place they go for the Lord. And that's what this is about. His, you know, his seed will be mighty. Part. They're going to impact the world. The generation of the upright shall be blessed, meaning the descendants. I want to see my kids and now my grandkids. I got to start praying for them. Right now I'm just praying for them to be saved. You know, and I go through an order. Lord, save Titus and save, hold on, Caleb and Gabe and Sadie. Hold on here. And, um, 
and Gideon? No. Gideon and Felicity and Andy and Emery and Ben, Judah, Malachi, and Elijah. <laughs> it's hard because it's dancing around families. But I, I, I will pray for them to be saved. And what's funny is recently, whenever I grab them, I'll grab them and hold them and say, Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Bless them and bring them a godly pretty wife if it's the grandsons or, you know, or the granddaughter. You know, I just I want to pray for them. I want to see them impact the world. And he says that if you honor the Lord, your children are going to. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. Now, I don't believe God's promising us material riches. I think he's talking about spiritual because Israel was an earthly kingdom. For us, it's spiritual. And his righteousness endures forever. Under the upright, there arises light in the darkness. So you know what, guys? The darkness is the future. We're living in darkness. But you know what? There could be darkness all around me, and God can fill me and my, ha my house with light. And I want that. How many of you want your family filled with light? You know, light upon your family. I don't care what the world's doing. God rules. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. You know, God is. And, um, and I believe that he's referring to also how we're to be. A good man shows favor. You know, if, you're, you know, if God's hands upon you, you're fearing him, then God's going to use you to influence. He shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion and that's literally with a plan you know his, his our life won't be in chaos surely he will not be moved forever and that literally means he's being stable the righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance how many of you want your life to be stable see nothing can affect and and disrupt my life except God allows it and he goes on he says he will not be afraid of evil tidings so listen there might might be bad news. Think about this day 18 years ago. You know, 9-11. Think about that news. I don't care what the news is. I don't care how bad or what happens in the world. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. Why? His heart is fixed trusting the Lord. Listen, guys. You, how many of you want peace in your life? You want peace? See, there's people who, who struggle with anxiety. There's people who actually take medicine for anxiety. Anxiety is a feeling caused by fear, and it's usually triggered by a thought, but fear and faith are opposites. Okay, you cannot be in fear and trust God at the same time. And so, trusting God is a choice, and that comes as you know Him. I've had 40 years of trusting God, and I realize He's in control. And so, you know, I really believe I can say this my heart is fixed. Lord, you've got me. I'm in your hands. I've been in a thousand situations that look impossible, and you've always been faithful. You've always been good. I don't have to fear. And I'm it says he's not given a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And I believe it's a choice. And it doesn't mean that there aren't feelings of fear, but I don't follow them. Do you guys realize that? We're not to follow feelings. We're living in a day where feelings are exalted. There's a lot of wrong feelings. And, um, and I can have feelings of fear. Matter of fact, I'm kind of the kind that if I feel fear, it makes me want to do it more. Okay? Because God's not trying to motivate me with fear. I remember when, um, when I was a kid, I used to do um, backflips on a trampoline and a diving board. Board. And in trampoline, you go straight up and down. Diving board, you go backwards. Well, within a two-week period on both of them, I switched it. I went up and down on the diving board and hit it. And then I went backwards in the trampoline and landed in the springs. And I went like 10 years without doing that. And now if I ever see a diving board or a trampoline, I'm making myself do that. Because I'm not letting fear rule over me. And here's the thing, guys. I don't want fear to rule me. If, you know, if there's a chance to go out and share my faith or do anything for the Lord and there's the slightest bit of fear, I'm doing it. I'm not, I'm not going to let fear be the boss. And uh, we don't have to let fear rule us. And um, his heart is fixed, trusting the Lord. His heart is established. That means literally just rooted, solid. He will not be afraid. I love this, guys. And see, that comes from faith, and faith comes from God's word. Until we see his desire upon his enemies. Look at this. How many of you want to be that person? Not afraid of evil tidings. Heart is fixed, trusting the Lord. How many of you want to be that? You want to be that? You know what? 
and we can, and it comes from God's word. God's word is what's going to produce that trust. And he says he has dispersed, he has given to the poor, and it's interesting, I think this is talking about the person God's blessing. His righteousness endures forever. So we become someone that's blessing those around us, and, um, and, and our righteousness is given from the Lord. His horn shall be exalted with honor. If you fear God, he's going to lift you up. And I believe he wants to do that with all of us to be a light. And he says, um, the wicked shall see it, meaning they're going to see the righteous lifted up and be grieved. He will gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. So you're going to be someone who fights God, and you're going to see God lift up those who fear him. Listen, school, work, family, if you honor God, he's going to lift you up and give you a place of influence. And he's going to use you to affect other people's lives. And some people aren't going to like it. Just realize that, guys. Psalm 113. This is the Hillel Psalms. Third, 113 and 118 were all praise and worship, and they were sung at Passover and different festivals. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, ye, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So we're told to do this, guys. And I'm telling you, you're ever down or discouraged. And we talk about anxiety and fear where there's depression. Depression is an emotion. It's a feeling. You don't have to give in to that. You start praising and worshiping God, and God will lift you up. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of of the sun to the going down of the same, the name, the Lord's name is to be praised. So look at this. He's talking about praise. And what is he praising here? He says, verse one, praise the name of the Lord. Verse two, blessed be the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. So do you guys recognize God saying we need to lift up his name, right? Why is that important? Because God's name is his nature. Okay, he's all become one. Everything we need is in his name. There's power in his name. So would you guys say his name is great? Would you say, how many of you would say his name is the greatest thing there is? Would you say that? No, I would tend to say that, but believe it or not, there's one thing he puts above his name. Here, all these verses are saying, praise the name of the Lord. Go to Psalm 138 for a second. And this is one of my favorite verses. Because as awesome as his name is, he lifts up one thing above his name. And there's nothing exalted above what he's going to share right here. Psalm 138, verse 2. He said, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise thy name for your loving kindness, for your truth. And look at this. For you have exalted, magnified what? Your word above your name. So God's name is great, but what's greater than God's name? His word. And why is that? Because his name is connected to his word. If his word is no good, think about that of a person. How many of you know somebody that their word means nothing? Well, then their name is nothing. You know, your, your, the honor of your name is directly connected to your faithfulness to your word. Who would say God is very much faithful to his word? And see, what is under attack by the devil isn't God's name, it's God's word. Right now, all around us, there's an attack on his word, and I'm telling you guys, if the devil devil is trying to take down God's word and, and keep people away from it. We need to be more determined than ever to read it. Nothing will change your life, give you peace, blessing, and direction more than this book. This is the owner's manual for life. And if you don't know what's in this book, then you know what? Your life's going to be a wreck. He goes on, verse 4, The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. And, you know, you sit here. This is the, these are the kind of verses, guys, when I'm reading. It's like, okay, the Lord is above all nations. We see the world in chaos, yet God's still on the throne. I remember in 1981, a handful of guys were all on fire for the Lord. And no matter what happened, our response was, the Lord's still on the throne. And he says, his glory above the heavens. Who is like to the Lord our God who dwells on high? There's no one like him who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He humbles humbles himself to reach down. I remember reading on a very a very prominent, famous businessman who um, would make it a point when he was at it. We're talking thousands of employees. If he would see a gardener, he'd go over to them and talk to them. And they said it wasn't much to him to do it, but it meant a lot to that person. And he's humbling himself to somebody, obviously, who's serving, you know, and this person's elevated. Well, God, when he just looks at us, he's humbling himself. And look at it. 
says. He raises up the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the needy out of the dunghill. <laughs> you know, we all have life verses, and this is one of mine. Okay, you know, what does it say? Not many mighty, not many noble has God called. He's called the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And, you know, when my dad died, I was the biggest nobody in the world. And I feel like he just reached down and said, I'm going to pull you out of the dung hell. Look what it says, that he may set him with princes. Listen, guys, I've sat with, shared with, talked to people who are billionaires. Okay, shared the gospel, pray with, they get my Bible studies. You know, and even with the racing stuff. You know, you guys realize drag racing, for the most part, is a rich person's sport. I mean, I'm not rich. And just at Indianapolis, the biggest drag race, I remember sitting in this car, and, I, and actually, my reading, I was studying this before I, you know, when I was there, and it's like, you know what? There's got, almost every one of these guys who are racing, they're wealthy businessmen. They've got money, or somebody's paying them a lot of money to do this. Or, And it's like, I shouldn't even be here. But why did God put me here? He put me there to be a light for him. I'm the biggest nobody. How many remember the Kurt Warner story? That's a classic. He's a stock boy in a grocery store. 12 months. If you look on the calendar, okay, it's January. 12 months later, 12 months, MVP of the Super Bowl. If you could some, go back in time and go to the go to the you know the grocery store and he's back like emptying boxes on shelves. Hey Kurt, you know what's gonna happen in 12 months? You're not going to believe this. <laughs> You're going to be the MVP of the Super Bowl. What happened was he was in the arena football. He got picked or signed as a backup quarterback. First game, the starting quarterback got hurt. I can't remember who it was. It was the Rams. And then he ended up being this amazing talent, went to the Super Bowl more than once, MVP. <laughs> Why did God do this? Because the first words out of his mouth were, I'm here to glorify Jesus Christ. Everything I have, everything I am is because of him. And I believe the Lord, if your attitude is, Lord, I want to lift your name up, I want to serve you. That's what I, when I go to the drag races, Lord, give me a platform to tell people about you. I'm not going to do this just to race. Because racing is vain. It's completely empty. It's absolutely worthless. But if I can use it for the Lord, then it's an awesome thing. And he's used it so many times. He raised up the poor out of the the dust. He lifts the needy out of the dunghill. Can anybody else feel like that's you? That was me, big time. That he may set him among princes, even the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman to keep house and to be for the joyful mother of children. So this is a picture of a blessing. Now I'll tell you something, guys. There was a time that barren woman was like a curse. That was a horrible stigma. The greatest blessing for a woman would be to have a lot of kids. You know, there was a time in history before the industrial age, kids were a blessing because it was more of an agrarian society. And so if you had a lot of kids, you had a lot of kids who would work for the family, whatever you did as a business, usually a farm or whatever, and it meant a lot of wealth. And so there was a time in history where like Sheila would be looked at as this amazing woman. But, ne but now because of industrial age, Everything's kind of flipped to where children are not seen as a value, they're a liability. And so, I mean, we've endured, gosh, ever since we started ha after about two. Don't you know what causes this? Are you going to have any more? You guys are crazy. You're part of the problem. Do you guys realize, remember, remember the 70s, the whole population explosion worried? Does everybody remember that? There was never a danger of population explosion. The danger has always been depopulation because the whole social network is designed to have a few older people and a lot of young people taking care of them. When Social Security started, there was 300 workers for everyone on it. Now there's three. It's less than three, actually. And, and the Western societies cannot maintain the social networks. The idea of Social Security, if you're under 40, forget it. You will get nothing. It will not exist by the time you're old enough. And it's not possible. The numbers, I, I saw, they said that the, the, the the, the debt, not just the national debt, was like twenty trillion, but the, but the um, the unfunded liabilities of cities and, and the federal government to pensions and all this stuff is like two hundred trillion. It cannot be sustained, and um, and so the problem is, is is we look at kids as something we don't want, and so now women, and this is just a general thing. I'm not saying to anyone in here, but the idea of women having children is looked down upon. And notice it says. 
she, and she, uh, the barren woman will keep house and be the joyful mother of children. That's meant as a, wow, you're going to have a lot of kids and you get to take care of the house. <laughs> but see, what's happened, guys, is, is that, you know, you've had this change to where women are being brainwashed to not have kids. They want to go into the workforce. What's interesting is one income of a man in the 50s and 60s, what happened is women went into the workforce and it dropped the wages. Do you realize now two incomes right now are required to equal one income in the 50s and 60s? Do you guys realize that? And, um, and see, the model of a husband working and supporting a wife and kids and a wife raising the children, that was God's model. That is despised. You realize that, the traditional family? And I mean, I understand there's divorce, there's single moms that don't have a choice to work, and I'm not, and I'm not saying anything against that, but I'm just going by the model. The model was for the man to take care of, and actually, this idea of keeping the house, jump over to um, Titus 2. And this, this, this kind of Bible suit that I'm sharing here is not necessarily a popular popular thing in this day and age. And, and you guys realize the most important person in our society is the mother with little children. Because even Hitler and Stalin both said, you give me a child till he's six, you can have him the rest of his life. So mommies, the, you have the biggest influence on the children under like six years old. And um, you're ingraining in them a pattern that nothing will undo it. And, um, and if it's for the Lord, it'll be for the right things. And if it's not, and, and, and moms have the next generation and you know it's interesting guys I think about this a lot the devil's strategy for society was to get the men to fall in the sexual sin the sexual revolution of the 60s and sexual sin will cause men to be weak they can't lead and so then that will open the door for the feminist movement women you know in a sense rising up and what it does it leaves the children without that influence at home and Jesus said the last generation they're going to rise up and have their parents put to death and so you literally have children not being but look at Titus 2. It says here, talking about the older women, verse 3, the older women likewise, a behavior that becomes holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, to be chaste, keepers at home. It literally means working at home. The stay-at-home mom. You know, isn't that like a despised thing nowadays? You know, if you talk to a young girl, um, you know, so often, if they say, oh, I just want to be a wife and a mommy, that's looked at and ridiculed that should be encouraged and um anyway but go back here i just the, this whole idea go back to psalm 113 you know a woman keeping house being the joyful mother of children i will tell you this too guys the happiest women i know are the ones who are mommies raising their kids and again i know we're living in a society where there's broken families husbands not faithful divorce and that and that and that and i feel bad because sometimes women are put in a situation they can't do this but i think deep down, if there's the highest calling, that's it. Raising the next generation. And um, But our society, how many would say our society is messed up and upside down right now? And so you can't go by what the culture is. And what I'm saying it very much goes against the culture. And then Psalm 114. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language. So think of them delivered from Egypt. That's a picture of salvation. We're, we're taken out of the world. Judah was his sanctuary and Israel was his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. So when God was moving for his people, he opened the door. He does that for us. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. What ails thee, O sea, that you fled? And you, Jordan, that you were driven back? You mountains, you skip like rams and you little hills like lambs. Tremble, you earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. And so here's God delivering his people, standing up for them and it's like hey the whole earth tremble do you realize that applies to us if you're a Christian right now God is on your side you don't have to be afraid and so we can live realizing the creator of the universe is on our side we don't have to listen if you fear God you don't got to fear anyone else which turns the rock into a standing water and the flint and the fountain of waters now this is powerful guys and there's a picture here that I want you guys to really grasp and matter of fact this is the most important part of the Bible study and Partly because Melody was short on a song. This is as far as I was going to go. But this is, we were like way early. But listen, this right here is the most important part of the Bible study. 
They were in the wilderness, oh, three million people. Let that sink in. No water. Do you guys realize there's a problem? <laughs> three million. Imagine being in the desert with no water source. Listen, food's important, but water's more important. And you know what? We know the story. Moses struck the rock and water sprung out. There's actually pictures I've seen. People in that area have found that rock. There's not a doubt in my mind it's the right one because it's this big, almost shaped like a big egg kind of thing and it's split right down the middle, but they've studied it, the erosion pattern is going upward, not down. It wasn't like water ran down and eroded this way. It was coming up. And then from there, you could see where it would have been this huge lake of water. Because you guys realize it takes a lot of water to get water for 3 million people. Well, picture the dryness, picture the thirst, and picture what that water would have felt like. Okay, without, wouldn't you just want to just dive in that if you're in the wilderness all the time? Now, now I want you to picture this life. Picture your soul for a second. There's nothing in this world that's going to satisfy your soul. Okay, the water is the spirit. I want to show you a couple of verses and I want to apply this to something. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. This is probably the most important part. Well, this is the most important part of this Bible study here. And um, we're living in a day. I just saw I just saw a um, article where some pastor committed suicide. And there's so many people dealing with what they're referring to as depression. And here's the thing, guys. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. If that's true, then the spirit overrules anything of the flesh or my emotions. And I look at them, 1 Corinthians 10. It says, Moreover, verse 1, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all meet, uh, eat of the same spiritual meat, so manna, which is a picture of God's word. And they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So what he's telling us here is them being in the desert, and this, this rock was Jesus. And what did it do? It brought forth water. Okay? The water is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Go to John 4. And I just, I want you to think in terms of, you know, your soul on the inside, your feelings, your emotions. And um, how many of you want joy and peace in your heart? Do you want that? Okay, it doesn't come from the flesh. It doesn't come from the five senses. It only comes from the Spirit of God. If you are not feeding your spirit, you will be down and you'll be depressed. The only thing that's going to give you joy and peace is feeding your spirit. The only thing that does that's God's word. So John 4, you know the story here, the woman at the well, and Jesus, verse 13, answered and said, whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. Meaning the physical water. Anything material, physical, you'll thirst again, you'll be hungry again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst for the water that I give shall be in him a well of water spring up in everlasting life he's saying that when you when he puts his spirit in you guys picture this for a second you're a soul inside of a body you're not that body you're going to leave that body inside your soul you know if you could draw it it's you know what is it what's the shape of your soul I don't know but inside of it there's this empty place and when God's spirit comes in it's like this well of water Water. And that water is where there's life, where there's joy, where there's contentment, where there's satisfaction. And so inside of me, there's this source where I can literally take a cup and just drink from it. If I'm down or discouraged, hey, do anybody ever get worried and afraid and depressed about life and things going on around you? At any moment, at any time, you can dip into this well. We already talked about it, praise and worship. You know, be filled with the Spirit, sing psalms and spiritual song, make a melody in your heart to the Lord. The, the lady who was at the concert and said, I wish I could relive this. Guys, we can relive this at all times. You can be in God's word. You can worship and praise him. You can be filled. You can drink from this well. It's right there inside of you. Okay, that source is there. You just got to take time. to. to and, and it's the Lord. It's your relationship with God. Jump over to um, John 7. And this is the last verse we're going to look at. 
said that. Where did Melody go? Oh, there she is. Okay. You're going to do two songs, <laughs> which is actually going to fit perfectly. John 7. Now, listen, guys. The Feast of Tabernacles, what was it would commemorate the Lord preserving them in the wilderness, okay? And part of this feast, every day they would take pitchers of water and dump it down the steps of the tabernacle and the temple, okay? It was a, and it was a picture of God miraculously bringing water. Well, on the last day, they would not dump the water because when they got into the land, the supernatural water stopped. And God, you know, because they were in the land, they didn't need it. And so if you look at John 7, verse 37... And I love this, man. I love this verse. And I, I still remember in 1981 being at a concert and these guys were singing this song. And it, it was, is, is anyone there? It was kind of one of those real kind of radical songs. It wasn't a worship song, but it was kind of a, I don't know what you called it back then. I don't know if it was punk rock or something, but it was, is anyone thirsty? You know, and then in the middle of the song, the line was, and God stood up. And so in the last day, verse 37, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood. Remember, there's no water this time. Okay, this is the last day. They're not pouring the water. Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Is any, in the line, the, the course of the song was, is anyone thirsty. You know, and they kept saying it over and over. Is anyone thirsty? You know, God stood up. I love this. Everybody's standing around. He's like, hey, if you're thirsty, what he's saying, he's, he's the rock. He's the one that gives the life. Think of being thirsty and dry in the desert. Now think about how that water would have felt. Now think about your soul. There are so many people walking around dry and thirsty because they're looking to the world to satisfy them. Nothing of the five senses are going to give you that satisfaction. He that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that would believe in him would receive, for the Holy Ghost is not yet given. So not just you guys, listen, you have a well in you that it can give you joy and peace, but it's going to overflow you and touch everyone else. Okay? We all have this, guys. How many of you want this? Moses struck the rock. That's a picture of Jesus being crucified. Now the second time he was told to speak to it, but what did he do? struck it again and he got in trouble. Moses, come here, son. <laughs> you're not going in. You lost your temper. I've, you're not going to do that. But he, he messed up the analogy. Once the rock is struck, crucified, all you got to do is speak to it. If you want the river of life, the water of life, Jesus, please fill me, overflow me, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. And you know what? He's going to do it every time if you ask him. And then when you ask, just start praising him. And you know what? You know, hands lifted up. Part of it is, Lord, here I am. Take me. And then part of it is, Lord, everything you are, I want and I need. And I'm telling you guys, it is possible to live in this place. You know, Chuck Smith said you want to live under the spout where the glory comes out. And that says you worship and praise God. He's going to overflow you and fill you with the Spirit. And there's a, listen, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, there's a well of water in you where you'll have joy and peace. And nothing... Money won't give it. A nice car, a nice job, education. I don't care if you have the best relationship, best marriage, best of everything. Nothing is going to give you joy and peace in your soul. And you know what? You can have turmoil all around you and struggles and battles. You can have darkness all around. And what does it say in the, in the psalm? Light. He will, he will give you a life and a light in the midst of the storm that nothing in the world can take away. And it's true. It's real. And so how many of you want that? So let's pray. Heavenly Father... I ask that every one of us here would see, Jesus, you are that rock that you brought forth living water. Lord, help us to see we'll never be satisfied with pleasure, with money, with food, with possessions, with accomplishments, with fame, recognition. There's nothing in this world that'll fill that empty place in our soul. Only you, Jesus. Only your spirit. And it's only your word that feeds your spirit. And I ask, Lord, that every one of us here 
would just give up and quit looking to the things of the world to satisfy us, that we look to you, that we connect with you, we spend time with you, that we would fear you, we'd be in all of you. All that matters is what you say and what your word says. And Lord, we fear you, we saw all the blessings. You will touch our lives and our children and our grandchildren, and you will lift us up, you'll make us a light to the world. And um, Lord, we give ourselves to you. I ask that you would fill us, each one of us, with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, even these two songs that Melody's going to play and sing, as we're singing, Lord, I ask that you would refill and overflow us and that we'd expect you to fill us. And Lord, as we sing, help us to praise you with our whole heart. May every person here really mean what they're saying and be in all of you. And Lord, that we would really sing to you. And, um, and as we do, that you would just put a song in our heart, that your life would just overflow, make us a blessing to those around us. And I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. May this be a week that you have one goal, and that it is all you care about is what God thinks, that you want to know what he says, and that you seek to honor him. And may all the blessings of those who fear God flow out of your life. So God bless you. And listen, guys, when Melody's singing with your whole heart, Sing to the Lord, because we're told to in the Psalms. God bless you.